record. Hello everyone, this is Terry Mitchell from the Voice on Fire interview series. And for those of you who may not have followed along or watched any of my previous interviews or even listened to the podcast, I have the opportunity to interview some pretty amazing people from around the world, either here in Australia where I'm located or anywhere in some of the, the amazing places around the world where people are making a difference. I choose people that are actually on a mission, people that have a passion about a project they're undertaking or people that are making a difference either for the local community or somewhere around the world. Um, and my guest today is Dr. David Vaughan, who is somebody who fits that criteria perfectly. Welcome, Dr. David Vaughan. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, Terry, for having me on board. Fantastic. And you may guess from the accents here, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and David is over in uh, the Florida Keys, and that's over in the USA. So it's been great to be able to uh, find time in our calendars to make this happen. I really appreciate that. Let's start this uh, conversation by asking you what it is that you do. Now, I can see in the background there that you have a banner that is about plant a million corals. Certainly would love to focus on that, but let's start by asking what it is you do. And the other questions I really like to get into is why do you do it and who do you do it for? Now, I know this is going to be a big set of questions because of what you're doing. So what is it that you do? Well, Terry, basically, I'm a marine biologist by training, mm -hmm. but I've had a checkered past <laughs> in dealing with both seagrass ecology okay. uh, to growing algae, to wow. growing algae for growing clams and oysters, to uh, expanding into growing um, uh, shrimp and other organisms, many of them indoor in recirculating systems so that like a greenhouse farm, mm -hmm. uh, they don't discharge any water outside of the facilities that could be a pollutant. Okay. But I continued to work on um, marine ornamentals and that is organisms that are used for the aquarium trade. Okay. Yep. And if you uh, get a, a tropical fish for your aquarium in the United States or Europe, most likely it came from a farm mm -hmm. and most likely in the US from Florida. Okay. However, if you went to try and buy a saltwater fish, let's say from the reef, 98% of them are coming from wild capture mm -hmm. from reefs around the world. Sometimes in less desirable or less sustainable methods. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to develop the technology to, to grow uh, the uh, anemone fish, mm -hmm. sometimes known as the clownfish, mm -hmm. or in the movie Finding Nemo, uh, two years before the Disney movie came out, oh, wow. and we're surprised that we were successful in producing thousands of fish for the aquarium trade from a uh, oceanographic research institution. So we were forced to turn it into a for-profit company and decided to put those profits into research of more species than just the clownfish. Okay. And we chose uh, a reef species such as soft corals and hard corals uh, from the Pacific, which was legal to get at the time. And we produced uh, about 100,000 corals for the aquarium trade. Wow. And I was giving a uh, tour um, to the grandchildren of Jacques Cousteau, that it was uh, oh, wow. Alexandre Cousteau and yeah. Philippe Cousteau. Wow. And when I showed them the large clam hatchery that was training fishermen how to be clam farmers, they loved it. And when I showed them the indoor shrimp, they loved it. And the clownfish they liked. But when I showed them the corals in the greenhouse, Philippe looked over at me and said, Dave, you don't get it, do you? And I said, what's the matter? He said, why aren't you doing this for the reef instead for the pet shops? Okay. And I said, this to me is a game changer. Yeah. And uh, Philippe Cousteau and I started the first international coral restoration initiative over 20 years ago. Oh, wow. wow. And since yeah. that time though, I have literally stumbled upon a way 
to grow corals much faster. That is a game changer for this world in light of climate change and the plight of declining coral reefs. So it's a new technology that is well needed to be known by people worldwide. And they also need to know what is causing the problem mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they can solve the climate change issue that's putting such stress on things lots, such as corals or polar bears, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's quite amazing. And you've been doing this for 20 years and I can imagine you would have seen a lot of change in the coral uh, reefs around the world particularly in places we know here in Australia that our um, Great Barrier Reef is under threat, has been for some time. What do you see as having been the changes over the last 20 years that you've been involved in this coral restoration? What did it sort of look like at the beginning? And have you seen any sort of changes over these past 20 years that both inspire you or encourage you, but also alarm you? What sort of um, experiences have you had there? Well, Terry, I've been very blessed in the opportunity that I have gotten the ability to do my first science expedition in 1966 mm -hmm. at the age of 13 to wow. look at coral reefs in the Virgin Islands for a future West Indies laboratory. Wow. And at that time, over the past 50 years, regretfully, I've watched as things have declined. And uh, it's amazing that in just one person's lifetime, one generation, I have to now show students learning to dive where some of these corals may be found that literally were just covered over the bottom and it took a while to swim through them to get to see a, a different type of coral, like a brain coral or mountain coral. So uh, it has been very uh, heart-wrenching for me to, to witness that just as people must have seen uh, also in the areas that were forested or that were developed after uh, a number of decades. But in most cases around on the planet, on the land side, it's just local areas may be developed. Mm -hmm. Where here with us uh, underwater, it's really a world problem. Mm -hmm. Climate change has impacted corals around the world. And to the tune that we've lost close to 50% of the world's corals in my lifetime. Oh, wow. That is a significant number. That is quite frightening um, to think that so much can change in such a short period of time, which I guess in one sense kind of leads us into the discovery that you've made. And I have read some of the details about it on your website and a few different articles that I've read about what you're doing. Now you've discovered, and I, I believe it was by accident, but it was a positive accident that you were able to discover in that process how to help coral to regenerate more, uh, more quickly. Um, share that story. Well, sure. Um, you know, most scientists don't like to be known as a, somebody who made a mistake. Mm. And uh, this one I'm proud of because it made the front page of the science section of the New York Times, wow. calling it my Eureka mistake. Mm -hmm. And it is a game changer. Yeah. And uh, it's been one that I'll tell you about, but it's, it's changed my life at my age, mm -hmm. uh, usually the age of being retirement, to try and make sure that I can show people around the world how this is done mm -hmm. and train them how easy it is to do. And so hence the new foundation, Plant a Million Corals, mm -hmm. is, a, is a not only a good vision and a mission, it's the recipe. Okay, yeah, wow, yeah. So the accident uh, really started because uh, in the United States area of the Eastern Atlantic and the Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico side, we only have two of what is called an Acropora coral. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of fragile branching corals mm -hmm. that look like a deer's antlers. Okay. Now the Pacific and uh, Australia has hundreds of species of those. Um, but most of our corals in Florida and the Caribbean are made up of what we call the massive corals. It's the large bombies as you call them. Mm -hmm. It's older corals, the brain corals, the ones that get very large and literally make up 
the development of the reef itself mm -hmm. and provide both the habitat as well as the shoreline protection uh, for people during storms. Okay. It's yeah. not the small fragile ones. Mm -hmm. In Florida, we just have two species. One is uh, called the staghorn coral because it looks like a deer's antler and it grows very fast and it has evolved to be able to break in small storms into pieces that if they land in a hard area will attach themselves and grow back up. Wow, and okay. That was the beginning of coral restoration at least most places around the world. They mm -hmm. learned that underwater, you could manually just break a piece of corals in with your hand and it will grow back fast okay. into many more inches of coral. But no one was dealing with the mass of species. In Florida, we have about 30 species. Two of them are the branching. The other 28 are the mass of corals and no one was attesting to them at all. Okay. because they became large, they did not evolve to break into pieces normally, but they went with the sexual reproduction cycle. Mm -hmm. Now I say that because not many people know what the sexual reproduction cycle of a coral is, mm -hmm. but it was discovered in Australia one night in 1985. Okay. And it was not known that corals had a sexual cycle until then. Can you imagine if farm animals, we didn't know how they replicated or reproduced, <laughs> or, or trees, or birds, or flowers, or trees. Am I correct in understanding that it's called coral spawning? That is correct. Oh. So yeah. one night, usually in a year, at a specific time, mm -hmm. for only a few minutes, they release gametes, yeah. which slowly float upwards, looking like upside down snow. Oh, wow. And they reach the surface, burst open, and release millions of eggs or billions of sperm that may come together. Mm -hmm. But it's only this one small moment. So unless you happen to be out there uh, in the middle of the night <laughs> to observe this, you wouldn't even know what it was. Yeah. So um, we decided to try the big elkhorn coral, the mm -hmm. one that has something more close to an elk or a moose antlers mm -hmm. and we collected some of the spawn and brought it back to our laboratory. Now we had found out in previous times that people had been trying to settle successfully corals. Uh, this was back in you know the year 2000 to 2010 but no one have, had ever really gotten more than one to survive. Okay. And we got about 11 or so to make it of what I called our first test tube baby laboratory corals. Okay. And we were so excited, except the number was low, mm -hmm. but it's better than the one in a million that makes it every hundred years in nature. Yeah. And But I was disappointed that almost a half a year to a year old, I still had to look at them and show people under the microscope. Oh, wow. They're still very tiny. Mm -hmm. And now that's a wonder why they make it at all with yeah. being that small for that long. And two years old, they were the size of a small coin. Three years old, the size of a large coin. Oh, and at wow. three and a half years old, they weren't growing very well. So I got disappointed in their growth rate, thought this was no longer a viable method to use. And I placed them on the lower rack of the glass aquarium tank and forgot about them. Mm -hmm. And then on one day where we usually every half a year clean the tank out and move the corals to a new clean tank and move the next group over, I went to move one and it stuck and I didn't know why. So I yanked it and I heard a crack and it broke into small pieces. Oh, wow. And it had done what it, corals can do best is after a while grow onto a surface and I had, was not aware of it. And I literally broke it into about a dozen tiny pieces and broke off a piece the size of a small coin that took its first two years to grow. And I thought it was gonna hurt this precious laboratory specimen. And that's not what happened. Okay. What happened was uh, just a few weeks later, I went to look to see how stressed it was and it had grown back the kind of tissue that had taken two years to grow in two weeks. Wow. 
So I literally ran back to the old aquarium where the couple little fragments were left and they had all grown back to a, a similar size. And so wow. as any good scientist, I grabbed a scalpel and tried the experiment over again. Mm -hmm. And it works with every species of coral we've tested so far. Wow. And with the same kind of regenerative uh, speed or is there like a difference in, in growth rate for different coral? Yes, each of the corals respond a little bit different in, in time it takes them to get to start growing again and how fast they grow. But in most cases, what we used to do is start with a coral the size of a golf ball. Oh, wow. And, and usually we would wait two or three years till it just got a little bigger mm -hmm. and we would cut it in half. Yeah. Now we take that same golf ball size and we used a specialized diamond uh, tipped saw mm -hmm. that is meant for making coral jewelry into, and stones into small diamonds and things like that for jewelry. Mm -hmm. And we use it to cut the live coral and its skeleton into the same small size pieces. Yeah. So now a coral the size of a golf ball, we will cut into 20 to 100 micro fragments. Wow, that is a significant difference, isn't it? It is, so now instead of waiting three years to get go from one to two, Every six months, we can produce another 20 to 100. So yeah. we literally are producing hundreds of corals, if not a thousand in a single day. And within a few months, they grow up to size and are either ready to be planted or ready to be cut again. Wow. That, that obviously, that must have been quite an amazing discovery. And it must have not only just excited you to a degree, but giving you some hope, would that have been also the case? Oh, absolutely. You know, there was a lot of uh, coral biologists that were watching as climate was changing, the ocean temperatures were increasing, uh, the amount of stress on our coastal environment, the amount of uh, pressure from, from fishing and just about everything else were all taking its toll. And I have to tell you that most coral scientists were starting actually to get very depressed. Mm. And in fact, we used to uh, make ourselves feel better because we said we needed our own self-help group of how mm. we tell people how bad things are with corals without them turning off and thinking we are just doomsayers yeah. and not wanting to hear anything else we say. Now we do have that hope mm. and the next generation is really uh, receptive to it because they know that now there's a chance with new technology for them to try and turn back the plight of the poor coral reefs that almost everybody is aware of nowadays. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can imagine just how hard it would have been to, to see that initial coral plights. And obviously, as you've talked about some of the stresses on the ocean, and now to be able to say, hey, look, we're, we're on the right track now. Uh, something that you did um, that our audience might be interested to check out a little bit later is your uh, TEDx talk. And I was listening into that and uh, there was one, one thing that you had said that uh, really made me so aware of just how important the coral is to our livelihood, just as humans trying to exist. And that is you ask for the audience participation. And I liked how you actually just got them to breathe. And it never occurred to me. And I suppose that's because we're just not educated about this, just how vital coral is to the provision of oxygen and provision of air that we breathe. So it's it must be reassuring also to know that there are a lot of, particularly with the likes of um, Greta Thunberg coming through and saying, well, you know, the environment's pretty much screwed up because of past generations and no one's thinking of the kids that we're passing it on to. This must be something that we can look at and go, wow, hang on a minute. We have an opportunity here to do something that can make a massive difference. Obviously, my, my thought with all of this prior to coming to interview with you today was with the discovery of how to create coral that can regrow uh, and I suppose a more mass scale and more quickly, 
we were talking and you've mentioned the stresses and there there's so many stresses in the ocean um, to add to the stress list just for those people who are here in Australia and anyone around the world that's been in this situation New South Wales and Queensland which is uh, up north from me quite a couple of thousand of kilometers have been inundated with uh, in some places 14 inches of rain and the mass floods are horrendous and we we get floods here in Australia lots of places get floods and People say, oh, but, you know, the rubbish in the oceans, you know, it's, it's, it's just people being really careless. It is to a degree that does happen, but there's also when you have a mass environmental event, a weather event of such magnitude where the ocean comes to the shore and floods the environment and then recedes back out to the ocean, floods the, the rivers that then flow out into the ocean, there is so much human detritus that goes out with that. It's not people just randomly throwing their rubbish in the ocean which obviously is still a problem but there's human existence and plastics and papers and, and all bits and pieces that we have on the, the land then we have a water event massive flood tsunami in some cases takes it all back out to the ocean to me that is equally if not more so one of the stresses that the ocean has to deal with are you seeing any sort of issues where all the fantastic work that you're doing just kind of seems it's going to be up against a bit of a brick wall in terms of human intervention and the things that we're doing to add stress to the ocean? Well, I think the amount of stressors, uh, you know, are about a dozen. And in each area of the world, you may have a different priority of which one is the most. For instance, in places of in Indonesia, that they, they actually fish on reefs with dynamite and blow up the reef to get the few stunned fish. So that's a, that's a pressure that hopefully with education, you can explain that if the reef isn't there anymore, you're not going to get any more fish. Yeah. Um, then in some places, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, coastal pollutants from, from a decent amount of, you know, activities that may take place even hundreds of miles from the coast, but along the small streams and tributaries that on different rain events may make their way and their fertilizer and their nutrients mm -hmm. and, their, and their pesticides down into the coastal waters with suspended solids. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of uh, things that, that we have found, you know, marine protected areas that protect from overfishing sometimes can bounce back. Uh, if we limit our uh, amount of uh, sediments that and elements that get into our coastal water, it, it's better. If we have management plants to keep the number of fish that might eat the algae that so it doesn't overcome the reef. All of those things are important ways. But the, now for the first time, the ability like in a forest or a rainforest that we can actually now cultivate trees and replant forests is a, a new future for not only the coral reefs, but for students who want to be literally underwater uh, forest rangers. Mm -hmm. They can be planting crops like a farmer. They can be managing underwater forests like a marine park manager. And all of these things are now possible. And yes, you were right before saying that the oceans provide more of our oxygen that we breathe. So we need to take a record of the entire health of our oceans. And it's produced, that oxygen is produced as a byproduct from algae from both seaweed and phytoplankton, as well as the algae that lives inside the coral animal itself. So mm -hmm. corals are a pretty unique organism in that they farm their own algae inside their bodies. And that's why they're on a reef, you know, trying to get as much sunlight as possible. And that's why the reefs also contribute to our own oxygen. Mm -hmm. And why, even though they are less than 1% of the bottom of the ocean, they're responsible for 25 to 40% of our world's fisheries. Wow. So if we lose our coral reefs, not only do we set into place, you know, the things that uh, are keeping the ocean as a viable uh, part of our planet, it should be called the water planet, not the earth, 
and dirt planet. Um, we're really on fire underwater as well with temperatures rising. And it's where the additional carbon dioxide wastes actually get dissolved in the ocean if they're not taken up by trees on land. So we're giving the oceans a double pronged problem, higher temperatures and lower pH by excess CO2. Mm -hmm. And remember that even though corals, uh, the animal part uh, gives off some CO2, the algae takes up CO2. Mm -hmm. And what they make their own skeletons with is calcium carbonate. That's it's fixed for millions of years in a way that's out of the system. So it's actually a, a very good thing to make sure we are prolific at it. Besides those other things, such as, as you probably well know, Australia is a $5 billion tourist industry to the Great Barrier Reef. So is Florida. So is Hawaii. And so besides uh, it providing a big amount of fisheries, there's almost 1 billion people on this planet that derive their daily food from a reef to sustain themselves and their family. If we lose our reefs, not only do we lose the commercial fish species that are so valuable to those of us to like seafood, but the sustainable uh, meals that keep almost 1 billion people on this planet fed, we're going to have to figure out a new way of producing food for those 1 billion people, or we figure a way to grow back our natural systems with living corals, protect our coastlines and our cities, uh, provide tourism, provide oxygen, and basically such a beautiful and unknown wilderness under, underneath that most people don't even understand what a coral is. Mm. Oh, um, absolutely. Everything you say there just makes um, amazing and in, <laughs> important sense in the sense of not only do, you know, corals, as you say, very few people would even know and they might recognise that little bit of pretty pink um, stick thing that sits inside their goldfish bowl, but it's like, oh, what is it? Well, it's coral, but that might be the extent of their understanding. There's no need for them in terms of their everyday existence to really know what it is unless they really want to understand the value of everything that's going on in the earth around them. And, you know, as you say, you know, we really should be looking at a what is earth? It's earth would suggest dirt, but really the planet is what, 70% water. So, you know, it's kind of strange that we've given it this terra firma kind of reference when it's really the oceanic reference that it, that it has. Um, and, and if people were to want to understand more about the corals across the oceans, um, if they were to come to want to check out more information with you, where would they get that information from? I, I believe you've got a website that I've checked out. Is there any other? Where would they, they come to to find out more information? Well, our website, the plantamillioncorals.org, is one of the first good ones, but we have some good government ones, both in Australia and in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, it's the, it's the Great Barrier Reef Foundation mm -hmm. uh, is realizing that they are putting a big push on not just uh, managing a protected area, but looking at actively trying to uh, plant and re restart corals. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, that's our NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, mm -hmm. is taking the lead role on what a coral is, both uh, education, research programs, management programs, and the like. So those two entity government entities would be some of the better ones to do. There's about three or four nonprofit uh, ones that have uh, information as well that you can look up uh, very easily. Mm, interesting. Are you seeing a, a, a real interest in, um, I guess, the forthcoming generations in the areas of uh, marine biology and any of the um, aquatic science um, uh, areas of, um, I suppose, the scientific world of employment? Are you seeing any sort of growing interest or are you wondering what to do next in terms of getting people interested in pursuing that level of career um, for within the environmental sciences? Yes, Terry, it's been amazing actually. Um, when I first started in the marine sciences, only a few people were interested in 
in the glitzy, sexy type of marine science of looking at sharks or, mm. or looking at dolphins or turtles. And that was about it until they figured out that they, they really probably need to have a career that gives them a job opportunity mm. to make a living and, and then disperse from there. So I used to talk to most people of my age and so many of them learning that I was a marine biologist, a decent amount of them said, oh, I already always wanted to be a marine biologist too, but I had to get a real job. Mm -hmm. And so today it's a different story. Today um, it's actually interesting because the areas of most interest right now is not necessarily sharks or, or dolphins. It's uh, coral reef restoration and coral reef ecology. And they're, it's because they're seeing that there's a, a lot of opportunities for positions. There are a lot of now marine protected areas that are hiring um, marine managers. There are a lot of universities that are wanting to teach courses like this because the student interest. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are, that are hiring to try and be proactive in both the education and, and transfer of technology and, and information. So um, it really is like aquaculture, the farming having opportunities for jobs. People can literally get jobs at coral restoration nurseries nowadays, and oh, they wow. can be an underwater farmer or an underwater um, you know, marine manager. And uh, so earlier on, 10 years ago, when we might get one applicant of a student wanting to be an internship with us for the summer, we now have a hundred applications in order to try and pick five or 10 that we can accomplish to try and train and educate of how unique a new technology is. And the most exciting part, Terry, is that we're so new and young in this technology that we're going to look back at some of the things that I did to be, we'll look back at like the uh, prehistoric era <laughs> because they're already developing new technologies. There's uh, uh, dot com companies looking at robotics for nursery production or even planting out under the sea. And there are people from oceanographic technologies, you know, looking to make things that could be used and there be a product for. So it's very exciting. And we could probably look at the best uh, analogy is probably uh, the aquaculture of fish or shrimp. There's thousands of people now employed for farming uh, fish and farming uh, shellfish. And I believe that there will be similar in farming corals to plant back on the reef or learning to propagate some of those fin fish species, not just the Nemo for the aquarium trade, but the species that people like to commercially gather and eat. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for for the young people. And it's perfect timing because I and a lot of other people started to see the lack of hope mm. and uh, the lack of being able to have fulfillment in what they're doing. And this gives that. This really is a, uh, a, a game changer that supplies both real production and, and satisfaction in seeing something grow very fast and uh, a fulfillment that they are contributing to, you know, the cause. Mm. Yeah. Wow. It's, I'd it's like to tell you if I can, um, about why they can see, you know, such good, uh, differences in a short period of time. Uh, one is one of the other attributes from this micro fragmentation that we had not expected at the time. And that is because we, cut a single coral into 20 to 100 pieces, we now tag the cement base that that coral is mounted on with glue or cement, and we tag it that it, of which parent it came from. In mm -hmm. other words, we give it a alphanumeric uh, name mm -hmm. or code to mm -hmm. track which one it is. And we grow them together in the same land nursery and field nursery. For two reasons. For one is we used to grow corals and we'd have to keep corals about three to five inches apart. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that was because corals, like sea anemones and a lot of things, could tell if something was else was growing next to them and wanting to grow over the top of them. So they were conscious of their ability to not be able to move far. And if anything else was going to grow over them, they wanted to fight them or even have a war to the death. Wow. So we would keep corals apart. Our corals were starting to grow so quickly because uh, we were growing about 600 to 1,000 new coral pieces in it every, cutting them every day. Mm -hmm. And so we needed an entire new tank for every day to plant these corals in. We didn't have the space. So we figured, OK, for a few months, we can put them close together until they start to grow. And we still didn't have enough tanks. and um, they watch when we watched them they grew to the edge of the t each of their bases and started touching the other coral and they didn't fight wow because they came from the same parental piece that they all started with oh okay they were literally clones from their parent yeah. and just like uh you know identical twins could probably be a good donor of skin you know, to transplant to their other twin because their skin might accept it, not reject it. So does the coral recognize it itself again. Wow. And so guess what it does? It grows back together. It fuses wow. together as one coral oh, if we wow. let it grow long enough. So wow. now, what we do is we'll take a coral head the size of, I usually use the example, a large pizza pie. Mm -hmm. You have pizza in Australia. Oh, yes, we do, we so, do. Yeah. Sure, a large pizza being a coral head that was regretfully killed, yeah. but the skeleton is still there. Mm -hmm. We can take those 20 identical clones and plant them on there like looking like pepperonis mm -hmm. scattered among a pizza pie. You got the picture? Yep, yep, yep. And the pepperonis, no, the corals actually grow out, touch each other, and as if you got extra pepperoni now. <laughs> <laughs> and then they touch each other, they recognize each other as themselves, and they fuse back together, and they produce in just a couple of years an entire new skin or tissue of living coral on a dead coral head that may have been a hundred years old and they do it in just a couple years. Wow. That kind of regeneration really obviously must give more than just hope. I mean, that sounds exciting for someone even like me, who's not, you know, even associated with anything that, that uh, is in the ocean. And, you know, there's, there's so much that you've covered there. It, it one, the idea that, um, and, I, and I was always fascinated by the various things that I've read about across different areas of technology having um, changed the employment of people going forward in a positive way in that the certain, what you've discovered has now opened up a whole range of uh, employment opportunities that weren't there 10, 15, 20 years ago. And now people can look at it and go, I'm going to become a, whatever that role is, which was never around 10, 15 years ago, and it's evolved and allowed for new opportunities. And that in a way, as you say, not did you have that issue of just one applicant coming forward for a role where you needed somebody. Now you've got dozens, if not hundreds of people going, I want to be in that role. And you've got a hand pick just because you just don't, you can't employ everybody. It would be fantastic if you could, but it's just not the way it works. So it's great to see that there's an enthusiasm coming through for new roles previously weren't there plus on top of that you've got the the new um say as you say dot com type uh um entrepreneurs coming through saying hey we want to invent something that's going to make this what you're doing even better than what it already is i, I guess not only is that fantastic to know that there's an enthusiasm for trying to repair damage that's been done and you know it'd be fantastic to know that the corals are going to be able to regenerate and that we're going to see a recovery, if not a, you know, as you say, a re a restoration of the the coral reefs around the world. Uh, one of the things that's been on my mind in terms of leading up to our interview is, 
and this is something that's a bit of a personal, um, I suppose, amateur historian approach in my mind about, you know, looking at the world. Our oceans were during um, 1940s, post World War II, were a dumping ground for a lot of the nuclear and um, military armaments. Have you seen any sort of impact? Because there have been um, stories in various, um, well, depends on where you see. I've seen a lot of it in documentaries and things like that, but suggesting that some of those are starting to decay um, after they've been in the ocean for 70 plus years. If they are in a state of decay, what do you see that doing in terms of having impact on some of the 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 chances of really helping this coral that you're going to great lengths to reproduce those sorts of things we're talking about the stresses i mean obviously there are so many other stresses as you say what what are we doing collectively though we're doing a lot of great things as you as you've mentioned what are we doing collectively that's going to improve the health of the oceans that will allow this coral to not suffer the same fate as the coral that you're trying to replace? What are the, the methods and ways that we're helping to ensure that this new coral restoration will continue to grow and maybe last for another 100 years? Uh, that's a good question. And I want to make sure everybody realizes that um, coral restoration is not the only silver bullet. We've got to stop the continued stressors, whatever they are, so that it's not impossible for corals to grow. Right now, we've lost half of the world's corals, but that means that the other half of the corals are naturally resistant to today's warmer temperatures, pH levels, pollutant levels, sediment levels, etc. And so, uh, the good news is that all we have to do is make more of those surviving resistant strains. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to necessarily do, you know, genetic modification, although I believe in the future people will start to select some of these uh, 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 traits that they have against certain stresses and be able to utilize them by, like we do with making a better you know, tomato that doesn't bruise as much and that maybe doesn't get mold. If we see that one is resistant to mold and one doesn't bruise easily, but if we breed the two together, we may get a few that don't bruise and are resistant to mold. I think we will get that. And that's what mother nature does, but over a long period of time, we don't have the time. So we need to speed up and help mother nature do this. At the same time, we've got to try and do something about that uh, curve of stressors that is taking place. The biggest one, the elephant in the room, is climate change. Temperature, if you go to a, uh, a pet store and say, I want to make a reef tank with some corals, and they'll say, fine, keep the temperature range very narrow. You don't want it to go over this temperature or under that temperature, and we've changed that in our oceans. Uh, who knows that we could do something so dramatic as change the temperature of our air, our planet, or our oceans? And we have. So uh, it's predicted that if we keep up at this rate, there won't be any corals to be able to be, have genetic resistance. So we have to have, thankfully, the thousands of scientists and people that are demanding either no, new novel ways of more sustainable usage of fuels or just by opting for more sustainable usage themselves. I, and you at home, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I had a big pickup truck that used, got only about eight or 10 miles to the gallon. And I traded it in for a smaller one that got, you know, 12 miles per gallon. Then I traded it in for a Toyota Prius that got 30 miles a gallon. Mm -hmm. Now I have an electric Volt from Chevy that drives for 50 miles without any. Mm -hmm. And um, if we all start to do similar things, uh, then we can make a difference worldwide. Mm -hmm. If the rest of the public wants to know what they can do to help corals, that's what they can do. They can help on the consumer level mm -hmm. by stopping those stressors and people are doing that they're looking for difference than 
than one use plastics that would end up in the ocean. They're looking at better ways of eating health wise that uses less land. Uh, they're looking at better automobiles. They're looking at better efficient air conditioners and, and usage of more sustainable ways of energy. And that's gonna go a long way. But if we wait till that's complete, it may be too late for the corals. We have to keep the corals growing. And here's one thing I want people to understand. Corals in, in Florida are only 28 species of corals. And you know, some people, if they really didn't understand you know, what corals did, like we had been mentioning before, from the oxygen to the food to the economy to saving the waves from hitting your, your shoreline and allowing you to live along the coast for protection, um, is, is that uh, besides those 28 species of corals, it's home to hundreds of species of fish mm. and thousands of species of invertebrates that require that reef to be functional for them to feed, breed, or raise their young. If we lose our corals, but just put a few in some sort of aquarium bank, but lose all those fish and, and invertebrates, even if we put the corals back, it'll take a whole new earth, heaven and earth to have those organisms come again. So we need to keep, it's like keeping the, you know, the oaks and the maples of a forest or the giant redwoods and sequoias healthy. So all those organisms that rely on that do not go to extinct. And so that's an important part. And we can keep, um, you know, some coral reef areas functional and keep all those other organisms, you know, besides even, uh, you know, the ones that just like to look at a beautiful reef mm. or the ones like in, uh, um, in, in Florida, the $5 billion economy that's directly related to scuba diving, snorkeling, mm. and uh, yeah. vacationing on the reef. And those 700 million to 1 billion people requiring every day some, some sort of substance to keep themselves and their families fed. So uh, it's important. And now there is a path and a method for it to take place. So I've gathered almost all the people that are doing these innovative sciences and trials in, in different countries. And we've put together an edited book called mm -hmm. Active Coral Reef Restoration, New Technologies for a Changing Planet. And it is basically a pathway to show people what we're doing and how it has been done in places like Australia and uh, Fiji and Costa Rica and each of about 12 different countries around the world details on how they do it because each of these areas may be a little bit different technique uh, needed and applicable to their economy and their community. So you mentioned that that's a book and I believe that that's going to be released very soon. Next month, yes. Oh, awesome. And how will it be available? Will there be um, ways that people can purchase the book if they want to? Sure. It's, it's uh, uh, going to be available by J. Ross mm -hmm. Publishers, but it'll also be available on Amazon in, in the United States. That's our big book distributor. And we'll have it on my Plant a Million Corals website of a link of how to, uh, how to get to that get to that book because besides it just being for all those hundreds of new students wanting to learn what these are or as a textbook in a university now or the practitioners that want to see how somebody else has done it a little bit better to learn it is actually good reading by the general public of seeing what is taking place why we need actually reef restoration and as it's being affected by climate change so they can be a part of when they take their vacation to see at the Great Barrier Reef or in the uh, islands of something, they, they'll know what they're looking at and they can be a part of the solution in helping. This is something that will take citizen scientists and volunteers in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really, really vital that just anybody that's listening, there will be links uh, beneath the uh, YouTube video in the description, as well as with the podcast, I'll include any links that uh, David can forward to me so that uh, for anyone that does have an interest or has had their, um, their sense of in 
um, urgency has been peaked because of this. It's really important that we, we expand our knowledge through education to understand it's, it's bigger than us. It's not just about you or me, David. It's about uh, every single human being on the planet has a responsibility to the planet that is sustaining us. And we've got to look at where, where do we start with that? Obviously, with the, the fact that we need to breathe. So anything that allows us to do that certainly has an important role to play. And, you know, we need to be more responsible and think about, well, what difference can I make? How can I make that difference? And just become more educated, become more aware, learn something new about the planet and understand that just one person out of all of the billions of people on the planet, one person can make a difference. That's really the premise behind why I do these interviews is finding that unique person who's doing something like you, David, that is making a difference, helping to encourage others to find inspiration and motivation to do something not just for themselves, but for the planet, for the what I call the global village, because we're all linked, we're all together on this planet. And I think if we can all take that one extra step toward making a difference in our own backyard, in our local community, in the country that we live in, or anywhere around the globe, then you know we, we stand a chance. And I think it's really important for people that have got kids. Your children are inheriting this planet. You want to make sure that it's the right planet. You wouldn't just you know, let them inherit, you know, the backyard garbage dump. I mean, but if we don't take care, sadly, that could be where it ends up. And we don't want that. So we need to take really positive action. I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. There is hope. And it's because there are people such as you, David, that are out there making a difference. I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I have really enjoyed hearing about what you're doing. And really what it is that you're doing, not just locally, but inspiring not only new uh, students coming through in the science areas, but also helping around the globe where all of these coral uh, reef projects can get underway. Whereabouts are they actually taking place? Uh, you've mentioned a couple. Are the projects for restoration uh, taking place like literally around the world or have you just started? Yes, there's um, uh, actually uh, in Florida and the Caribbean, uh, there's probably 50 different coral restoration projects. Now they may be small uh, and be one scuba club or shop with a few volunteers, and it may be large uh, and a whole community involved. In fact, one of the things that we're trying to do with Plant a Million Corals is to make sure that every island that wants to have their community involved in this can. Mm -hmm. And most of them in the past had visited my new the, work, the lab that I used to work at, at Moat Marine Lab, mm -hmm. uh, which was a $10 million laboratory. And when they saw what I was doing, a lot of them became disappointed because they thought they needed a $10 million lab in order to do this. Mm -hmm. So now we are making low cost, about $100,000, uh, a transportable coral nursery in a shipping container sort of like a transportable classroom. Wow. And we are trying to get sponsors who will fund that for a community so that they can have their own coral operation paid for. And then we're doing something kind of unique with the involvement of communities. We know that a land-based nursery tank is actually an attractant. Mm -hmm. It's not a nuisance attractant, mm -hmm. but because there's live corals within a couple inches of your face that you can see close up without having a mask, without having to hold your breath, mm -hmm. without having to dive, uh, children, people in wheelchairs in any weather conditions can go and visit these tanks, put their heads over the top and see a wonderful living colorful coral pumping the, their tentacles back at them. Mm -hmm. And they can see the sequence where we start with one and cut it into 20 pieces. And a little bit later, they start to grow up. And a little bit later, they form a colony head the size of a large pizza pie. Wow. And they can be part of an ex eco-educational experience. Mm -hmm. And we feel it's so attractive that people will be willing to pay at least a donation to go and see these Absolutely. and help keep the maintenance of, of these in communities well-funded for long-term. 
No, I think that's a brilliant idea. And, I, and if there's any links that you would like for me to include in the description, please email them to me once we've uh, completed our interview so that I can update that and increase the information that people have got access to. Uh, as I was saying, David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and if anybody would like to subscribe to the channel so that you get to hear more of these types of interviews and be inspired by the people around the world that are just individuals taking on the challenge to do something different to make a difference on the planet, then by all means subscribe to the YouTube channel and there'll also be the option to do that with the podcast. Thank you so much, David. It has been a great pleasure and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing when the book comes out and just knowing that people like yourself are making a difference to the air that I breathe. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to know that someone like you is making that difference. Thank you. And thank you so much for giving me the voice, which was on fire about what's <laughs> underwater. Thank absolutely, you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David.